Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to episode 52. Can you believe it? Number 52 of Coffee with Kramer and Colleen. And today we have a special guest. Colleen, welcome to the show this morning. Good Hello morning. and good morning. And today we are talking about wine. So we have Michael Snodgrass joining. Michael, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Don. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing awesome. Doing awesome. And as we sent out in some of the um, posts yesterday, today's kind of the vino episode. So we're going to be kind of touching base a little bit about wine. And who better to talk about wine today than Michael? Just to kind of give you a little background, if you don't know Michael, over 15 years of experience on the Las Vegas Strip in the food and beverage industry and at some great places like uh, RMC Food, who uh, is no longer here. So we definitely miss that place from you, Rick. Uh, Border Grill, Lupo, Spago, Bouchon, Herringbone, just just to name a few there. Also, Michael headed up the wine department as a sommelier at Otto, O-T-T-O, at the Venetian when it was there in the Grand Canal shops. And then also he helped lead, he helped uh, train the team at Italy at Park MGM, which is a really cool uh, both retail and dining uh, experience uh, at Park MGM and helped educate the uh, team on beverage, is sales, and operations. Additionally, he is also on the uh, selling side with selling uh, the fine wine division at Breakthrough Beverages, selling wines, beer, spirits, sakes, and such to restaurants and casinos in Vegas. And also, uh, to give you a little uh, educational background, uh, Michael has achieved many certifications. He is a certified sommelier through the Quartermaster Sommeliers and is a certified beer server with the Cicerone. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. You're testing all my Italian today, Michael. <laughs> Close, Don. Almost. We'll get there. I, I can get past Carbonara. That's kind of about some of my limits now and again. And he is a... Past levels one, two, and three from uh, Wine Spirit and Education Trust, including levels two and three with distinction, which is the highest score you can achieve. Additionally, uh, Michael teaches level one and two of the Wine and Spirit Education courses at the Wine Academy of Las Vegas. So if you're interested in uh, pursuing a course in wine education, definitely reach over to the Wine Academy and you'll be uh, learning a lot from Michael. He is also a certified sherry wine specialist and a student at the prestigious, uh, prestigious Vinely International Academy in Verona, Italy. And we've got uh, all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, while uh, while enjoying a little time during the summer, I know I likes to get away a little bit on the jet skis, do a little relaxation, but also to enjoy uh, enjoys a fine glass of wine. And this morning on Coffee or Kramer, Colleen, a uh, good cup of coffee. So, Michael, what are you drinking this morning? Uh, this morning, I decided to go with Samba Latte. Uh, and I'm drinking a lavender latte. I think lavender is great for anxiety and stress. Uh, and something that everyone needs to reduce right now in these times. Good point. Good point. Now, Michael, if we were to say it's a Tuesday morning and we need to crack open a bottle of vino, what should we go with to keep the stress down? I guess depending on how early Tuesday it is or what you're doing later, um, something lighter body and easy drinking, either something like a Prosecco or an Aperol Spritz, um, or even maybe some Albarino or Suave, something easy drinking and light to get through the day. That That's that's fantastic. Yeah, so 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 it's a little, little in keeping with kind of starting out the day, a little bit in keeping with the temperature, a little warmer, and keep you fresh and going. So I'm excited. To have, what's that? I just have a question yes. because you did that rather rather quickly and i think that i have plenty of friends including myself that would like to slow the roll a little bit what would be good in the summertime because sometimes you're on vacation and sometimes you're on a staycay for brunchy lunchy time like you said instead of or in place of if you didn't want a mimosa of course um a lot of people do like to do a rose in the summer or the warmer months um, refreshing, acidic, a crisp. Um, but I really love to go Riesling. I think Riesling is the perfect summer wine. It's very, very high acid. Um, you leave a little bit of residual sugar, which is going to balance out that acid. And you're really drinking an adult lemonade. So something you can drink all day long that's low alcohol, 
really refreshing, very food friendly as well. Um, and I think Riesling is the perfect summer wine for any occasion. And then is there a bubbly kind of a something that you would do if it's champagne's not the deal? Yeah, you can do champagne, of course. There's never a bad time for that, especially if you're celebrating and, and really enjoying life. Um, but I think Prosecco is a little bit better for the occasion. Um, you're not getting all that traditional method in sparkling wine production. So it's very easy drinking, fruit forward, tends to be dry. So the sugar is not going to hold you down or fill you up. Um, you're not going to have any hangovers from that as well. Um, okay. You can add a little Aperol to it if you want to give it a little punch. The, the apple? The Aperol. So you make an Aperol spritz, a little sparkling water, soda water on uh, sparkling wine and soda water on ice, uh, just a touch of Aperol on there. Uh, and you have something that you can drink all day long and still feel the effects. That's the fun part. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so and this is this is the fun part of it too, because I, I appreciate you speaking about Rieslings. I'm a big fan. So as you know, one of the things I love about German wines is from from the top of the cap all the way down to the bottom, it explains everything about it. You know, leave it up to German engineering uh, between gold cap and then, you know, what level what level and grade is a cabinet, is it a spate lace, a house lace, uh, so on and so forth. And there's some derivatives. So in the Riesling, and then there you've got the different regions. If you were to kind of hone in on it, would you kind of tend a little more towards the Mosul um, for this time of the year? You know, it really depends on the style that you like. Uh, the great thing about Riesling is based off the sweetness level, the bricks, the pedicle levels that you were talking about, um, or where it's grown, there's so many different styles of Riesling out there. So if you wanted to go to Germany, of course, Mosul is probably your most common that you're going to find. Really good uh, price point. You will get some really good qualities from Faust and Rheingau. Um, or you can jump over to France right on the board to Alsace, which makes some really great Rieslings as well. Um, so you have French and Germanic influence all at the same time. If you're more of a new world person and you don't necessarily want them sweet, um, there are a lot of good dry styles coming out of um, California as well as Australia, even Washington now. Um, so there are some other options if you don't want Germany, you want something a little more fruit forward um, and for California or one of the other regions. Great, fantastic, fantastic. Um, Michael, one of, the, one of the parts that I'm really excited about is these, you know, when we've got, gotten together and spoken quite a bit, you know, it's your your both depth and breadth in the Italian wines. I I like to say, you know, I've I've I, I've got a good feel of California, uh, not too bad on France. But when we start getting into the coastal med, I mean, we're talking, you know, Italy, Sicily. I I've handled quite a bit, but you know, kind of organizing and sorting my head out about Italian and the style and the process. I I am I'm a newbie. As many people, Don, it's one of the hardest regions by far. Yeah. So kind of give everyone, could you give people maybe the the five or 10,000 foot level about how Italian wines are versus, let's say, what we would normally more commonly see in, in France or New World stuff? Of course, Don. Um, I think with Italy, the great thing is that there really isn't a common style. There's a little bit of everything from everywhere. Every region has a different grape that they're known for, um, indigenous and native to that land that's usually not grown in the rest of the world, let alone the rest of Italy. So whether you're in Piedmont or Sicily, anywhere in between, um, you're going to get something original and unique to that area. Um, so if you're looking for more of a New World California style, you can go to Tuscany and you can get a Super Tuscan, a blend that has Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and something you're a little more used to in there that's fruit forward, high alcohol, um, a little more juicy. Uh, that might be more towards the Americanized palate. Um, or you can go to, you know, Piedmonte and get Nebbiolo out of Barolo and get something that's not grown in California and that has a little more of that kind of old world funk and tertiary aromas and mushroom, mm -hmm. tar, leather, dried rose petals, um, things that you can't get in other terroirs, if you will. Um, so the great thing about Italy is the hardest part is learning how to pronounce them first and learning, you know, the vowels in A, A, E, O, U versus A, E, I, O, U. Uh, so just like speaking another language, uh, but you mentioned Sicily, which is a whole other dialect as well. Um, so there's Italians and there's Sicilians that I like to say as well. So I haven't quite dabbled into uh, that part of the region yet, um, but the best way is to really go to Italy, to travel, to experience, to read the signs, to drink the wine. Um, there's no better way to really learn Italian wine and food is through the culture of actually being there and interacting with the people and going to the dinners and seeing the hospitality um, that Italy really has to offer. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And for, for those out there, you know, I know, I know we're, we're all concerned about traveling, COVID, all that type of stuff. But when things die down and, you, and you're ready to make a trip and you're looking for food, wine, life, lifestyle, book a trip to Italy. And if you can go spend several weeks, a month, go do it. I highly encourage it. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. So you kind of touched on some of the um, uh, Italian whites like Albarino and um and uh, or no i mean i'm sorry like a suave alberino's um pain. uh tell us a little bit about sort of some of the characteristics of um italian whites um yeah italian whites once again based off the region that you're in if you're a little more further in the north um in piedmonte you have a region called gavi that grows a grape called cortese mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the italian whites in the north are very high acidity um, they're unoaked. They don't have malactive fermentation, so they're not going to get those buttery tones you'll get from Chardonnays and things like that. Okay. Um, they're, they're not going to get any kind of those yeasty bread tones from sitting on the leaves. So a really clean, acidic, food-friendly, meant to be drinking throughout the day with fresh seafood or, or local um, foods, if you will, um, and relatively inexpensive and affordable. You're looking at less than $10 a bottle uh, for something of good quality. Um, you know, in a suave classical, which is north eastern Italy and Veneto. Mm -hmm. So around, along the north, you're going to have a lot more high acid wines, green fruit driven, lemon, lime, green apple. Um, and as you for, move further south, it's going to get a little bit more warmer. So you do have some wines like Radicchio or Fiano um, that might be a little bit less acidity, a little bit more body, a little bit more tropical fruit. Um, so you're looking at more of your yellow apples, yellow pears, into maybe stone fruit, peach, um, things like that. Um, so the further you go down south in Italy, typically the warmer it is and the bigger bigger the white wines will be. Um, so if you're more of your Chardonnay drinker, you want something bigger and robust, it might be best to go down to you know, Sicily or Campania versus if you want something more like a Pinot Grigio, crisp, refreshing, acidic, Piedmonte, Veneto would probably be your best bet for white wines. Gotcha. And I, I had some over that Veneto region where – you know, you almost have, in, you go up uh, up in some of the elevations, it almost has uh, a little bit of an Austrian quality to them. Um, you know, very, yeah. very minimally crisp with, it, with the, you know, I, um, I, you know, and I know this is kind of a weird uh, thing to say, but almost in some cases, even like a little bit of a petroleum type of aspect to them, like you would see like in a Riesling or things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Riesling definitely shows the petroleum the best, the kerosene, um, especially as it ages, which is a very desired flavor for a lot of people that's acquired over time. Um, but all of those northeastern Italy uh, regions have a lot of, you know, Germanic influence or Austrian or a lot of those other European countries um, throughout the years. There have a lot of been a lot of shifting from wars or who's acquired which lands and it went this way and then that way. Um, so the great thing is you can really experience multiple cultures in the area, not just Italy. Colleen, you got some, you taking some notes. I'm going to replay this over and over again and write things down because <laughs> things are going rapidly. So I'm, I'm just absorbing. Mm -hmm. And then up later doing a cheat time. sheet. Huh? So we can always meet up later for some wine and talk about it a little more in detail. Ex slowly and let me experience it. Yeah, that's good. As, as we so like no, to say, just, just keep drinking. Keep talking. I'll keep drinking. How's that? Don't worry about it. Absolutely. So, um, this uh, where you know one of the things, uh, Michael, that that I noticed when I started having or you know, drinking wine, you know, you start local, you kind of start branching out, and probably my experience you know, I, I'm still kind of a newbie to wine. I mean, I'm still, you know, probably, you know, late, late nineties, finally started having some, um, let's say Italian or Spanish varietals. And there was a trend, like it felt like that there was a internationalization of the, of the palate. And maybe that was because there were some areas that were more, like you said, in keeping with like a California style, um, versus the northern areas and such, but but I it, it, they kind of um, I remember the first Italian wines I drank had a very 
there was a level of rusticness to it. You know, and like you said, you know, maybe the more earthy qualities like the like mushroom truffle, um, you know, people would say maybe a little barnyard kind of aspect to it versus now um, there are some that, you know, maybe have there or maybe even some other areas. I've even seen it too in, in Spain where it's a little bit, you know, there was a period of time where they seemed to be, I would actually have a hard time just, you know, starting to say, okay, what region am I dealing with here? Have you noticed that? You know, what, how do you do? You see that? Am I imagining that that trend continuing, or has there been a fallback towards being a little more original? Absolutely, Don. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the American palate. Um, Americans, you know, used to California wines that are fuller bodied, higher alcohol, much more fruit forward, um, and they're not used to that old world funk, that tertiary aromas that you're talking about as well. Um, and I think things are shifting a little bit. For a long time, people started making wines in that style because that's what Americans were drinking. Um, and a lot of the other stuff wasn't getting exported, at least to the United States, because our palate wasn't there to drink it. Um, but I think there's been a shift recently as well. As people start knowing what is in their food and where their food is coming from, they want to know what the same with the wine. Um, and they want to taste things that are more true to the culture and the history and the family that's operating on the land. Um, so I think there was an influx of New World kind of California styles coming from Italy um, that has started to shift a little bit and go back towards that more old school kind of Italian funk uh, wines that are meant to be aged and develop different flavors. Um, and I think that's a big thing to deal with is a lot of people are drinking their wine a lot sooner now. They're not laying a bottle down for 10, 15, 20 years. So they're making wines that are intended to be consumed young within the first two, three years while they're fresh and fruity before they really develop these flavors. So a lot of times the wine just hasn't had enough time in the bottle to develop a lot of these flavors that uh, maybe you and I think of when it comes to Italian wine, because you're not going to get them at Total Wine or the supermarket, and you really have to go to, you know, wine bars like Garagis or better Italian restaurants like Ferraro or San Vegas to, to find wines like this on the wine list, because um, people just don't have enough money to have the resting inventory to have wines that aren't being drank every day. Um, but I think that's shifting a little bit. Okay, well that's that that's great, and like you said, it's probably probably the, the marketing exposure, but also to, you know, our, our palates may not have been ready for it too. And also with places, you know, great places like you've been to where you talk about Ferraro's in town and some other places where we're seeing more influence from Italy itself versus Italian influence from New York, Chicago, you know, so we're, over the last generation, we've seen an evolution just of that style of food from the mainland coming over here to the United States, that more traditional uh, presentation. Because even in the food itself, you go you go and have a traditional Bolognese, it is not the Bolognese we are aware of, of 10 or 15 years ago here in the States. No, absolutely. I think the uh, palate is definitely, you know, progressing and advancing and people are starting to realize what real Italian food is. Um, and yep. people are traveling a lot more. So people are actually experiencing Piedmont or Sicily and things like that. Um, and coming back and realizing that what they've been eating for the last 20 years isn't really Italian food. And now that they've got their first taste of authenticity, they want the full experience. They want authentic food with authentic wine. Um, and they know when they're not getting either of those two. There you go. There you go. Well, and, and don't you think that a lot of that comes from what you said earlier, which is we are more aware now of the freshness of the food. We're more uh, educated on what that food should taste like, what the wine should taste like. I mean, if you go back, cause I go back a ways, way farther than you two do. And wine was this, Italians have the jug of wine on the table. Do you know what I mean? The, the knowledge has become so much greater that we now are kind of um, dissecting the wines and saying, oh, look, this should taste this way instead of, you, you got the thick glass, you set it on the table and you got wine with dinner, unless you're at some uppity party or whatever. So don't you see those those kinds of um, qualities coming with our food and pairing with the wine? Absolutely, Colleen. I think uh, for lack of a better word, I think we are more woke than ever. Uh, people are have social media. They're going out to farms. Um, they they know, you know, laws and and uh, things like that for supermarkets and waste. So people are trying to make sure that their food is coming from a sustainable, healthy source that's not doing 
you know, bad things to the planet or to animals. Um, and they're willing to pay a little bit more money to have a little bit better product. Um, I think it goes for food, it goes for wine. So I think we're at a really good time for the industry, for food and beverage in general, as well as just naturally being healthier uh, and being better for our planet long term uh, versus the short term and the financial gain. Um, so the better we can as a community really embrace these trends and embrace the heritage and culture of slow foods and slow wine, um, the better we'll be as peoples as well as a planet. So I'm going to interject one more thing because um, there's levels of, of consumption for everyone. Um, you know, housing goes from a beginner all the way to mansion, correct? So wine does the same. Um, are there any rules of thumb you can follow to say I don't need a real expensive wine? I mean, I get the sipping and the and the when you have your special friends over, but what about on a daily or on a, a small dinner party or somebody that can't invest in expensive bottles yeah absolutely it's a great question because a lot of people think that quality of wine is associated with price um mm -hmm. it's not really that way um it's really based off personal palate and perception and what you like um so if you like a wine you like it regardless of the price point um and every class that i teach i usually ask people who liked which wine better and eight times out of ten they typically like the more affordable cheaper wine and it's because with more expensive wines you have more oak aging you have more tertiary flavors and bottle development. Um, you have more spice, you have more of those lees component or malactive fermentation for Chardonnays. Um, but the majority of people, they like un easy drinking wines that don't have a lot of those extra flavors. They want a fruit forward wine that they can taste the fruit, whether it's apple or some floral components um, without having to really dig into the wine and not know what they're experiencing. So they want a more simplified um, experience, if you will. Um, and that sweet spot for wines in the store, Cola Wine, um, or any other retail establishment is really between $15 and $20. So you don't have to go and spend $60, $100, $200 on a bottle of wine. Um, I rarely ever spend more than $20 on a bottle of wine myself, unless I'm in a restaurant, of course. And then I still think the sweet spot is less than $100. So I don't think you have to spend a lot of money um, to get a good wine. Um, so it really just depends on, on what you like versus sparkling, white, red. Um, but typically the lighter bodied, easy drinking wines that don't have a lot of tannins or spice uh, will be more affordable and more complementary to most palates. And is there any, um, there's no real way to know, correct? I drink them. That's really yeah, it. That's what you can't. You can't look at a region or a bottle and go. No, I mean, typically people like California or newer wines first because they are more fruit forward. They are more lush and ripe, and they don't have a lot of those off, funky aromas that take a little more of an acquired palate. Mm -hmm. um, but typically, people will go for sweeter wines first, maybe Moscato or an off-dry Riesling, um, and then go into lighter, fruitier red wines, such as Valpolicella or Beaujolais or Pinot Noir, before advancing onto something bigger body that has some tannins and more robust. Um, and then usually you can transition from there into maybe somewhere like Tuscany that has a fruit forward style of Italian wine before taking it one step further and drinking that Brunello that you had over there, Don, uh, which is going to have a lot more tannins and tertiary aromas from that age on there. Uh, so that's a little more for the advanced palate that you're carrying back there. So Michael, to, you know, kind of leading or preparing off of uh, Colleen's point, we're, we're, co we're coming into, uh, we're flying into Italy. We know California. We want to sort of like, we want to kind of like go with what we know a little bit, but we can land anywhere in Italy. We don't have to go into Milano or, or Roma. Where, where, where's the plane landing? What part of the, the boot are we landing in? Uh, I mean, really land in the boot. Well, of course that's an option, but uh, I think if you've never been to Italy to go anywhere, um, to have the easiest, most comfortable experience, I think Florence is the way to go. Uh, Florence, for me, had the most English-speaking people. Um, there was a lot of expats and international travelers and other Europeans who spoke English. So I didn't really see Italian as the most dominant language there, and most signs were in English and Italian. So it's very easy to get by from the airport to your hotel into the city. Um, and then it's only 40, 45 minutes from Chianti as well. So it's in the heart uh, of Tuscany, essentially, if you will. Um, it's near Brunello. It's near a lot of these other regions that are great for um, New World wine drinkers. Uh, and then you're really essentially located. From there, you can go down to Rome. You can go up to Piedmont, 
within two or three hours on a train, which is probably the most convenient way to travel within Italy. Um, so if I was to fly anywhere into Italy, it would be in Florence, just because of your location. Um, you're in the heart of Chianti, which is beautiful. And there's a lot of, uh, you get both the city as well as the wine regions, uh, which is hard to do in some regions as well. Usually it's one or the other. So that, that's the great, that, that's the great starter point for food and wine, uh, for somebody first, like, okay, I'm going to start from there and then kind of branch out. Personally for me, especially if you're not a natural Italian speaker, um, flying into Rome at first or, you know, Palermo, uh, can be a little difficult if you're not, uh, well-versed in Italian culture or language. Yeah. I remember trying to order lunch in Brescia. That was a challenge. Yeah. I went to Brescia on the train. Um, it's, it's very difficult. I got off as well and, and was quite lost myself. All I went was, I like the looks of that. I like the looks of that. <laughs> Which works. They understand and it comes out and uh, you still have a great time. So if we stayed in the United States, sorry, Don, I, I'm, I'm kind of throwing oh. this out there because I'm, I'm seeing a, a, another show actually because there's so many questions coming from that I can see the other side of. Don has a, a is very experienced with wine. I have a lot of friends that are, and uh, quite a few that aren't, and I'm somewhere in the, I know a little, but not enough to, to be any kind of dangerous. Um, so if you went, say, let's say you wanted to go locally, United States, what would be your go-to? And I know there are plenty of wineries, but you know, we have Temecula and people go, is there anything that, that, that would be a surprise that you would say, believe it or not, this is great? Absolutely. You know, it's funny you mentioned Temecula calling because I think recently in Wine Enthusiast or Spectator, uh, in the last year, they received an article on one of the top places to go for wine traveling. Um, and they're doubling in size over the next three years. I think they're going from 50 wineries to 100. Um, and I have some family in Marietta. So I, I travel through Temecula quite often. I love wine tasting there. You get some really high quality brands at a very affordable price point because they don't have the name recognition of Napa Valley or, you know, Sonoma. Um, it's much harder to find those wines here. Not a lot of them are exported, but if you're passing through, it's nice to stop at the winery and buy a case or join their wine club and things like that. Um, and there's a winery there actually in Temecula called Robert Renzoni, uh, which is, they do a lot of Italian brands. You actually see some Barbera, Grignolino, Sangiovese, and it's a Tuscan style winery in Temecula that are doing California or uh, Italian grape varieties in, of course, California. So you're getting kind of like that culture of Italian wine with a little more fruit forwardness and less of that old world funk that you'll see. So it's nice to kind of see the branch between the two cultures um, being grown. So I do love that area. Um, I think Oregon and Washington, of course, are great as well. Something that's a little more in between California and um, say France or Italy, because you're going to get a little bit colder weather. So you get a little bit of that funk, um, but still mainly fruit dominant at a fraction of the price that you're going to pay for say, California wines. Thank you. You're welcome. That's great. And so actually, that was a great lead in, uh, Colleen, because it sounds like in, in Temecula, you know, you've got a winery that is trying to do, okay, we're, gonna, we're going to kind of bring some of this old world um, grape style to this. And, and, you know, when you go up to Northern Cal, you go to Napa, Sonoma, I mean, they were, they were, this was a land that was founded by um, Italian immigrants. I mean, you look at the uh, great brands like, you know, you know, whether you like Gallo or not, I mean, they were the, they were like one of the pioneers, uh, Mandavi, um, you know, one of the great um, uh, vineyards, Rocchioli over in, in Sonoma. Do you see other areas that are trying to embrace saying, okay, we're going to bring some uh, old world style, you know, Italian style, uh, grapes and some of that method versus, you know, trying to be a little bit more there over here in California or other parts of the United States. Yeah, absolutely, Don. I think um, people everywhere are really starting to experience with different grapes and what they're doing in the vineyard, uh, especially with climate change as temperatures are changing all over. Um, people are starting to think about 25 years from now, 50 years to plant grapes. You need at least 10, even 20, 30 years to have good quality wine. Um, so a lot of the areas in the vineyards aren't able to successfully grow what they were growing before. So they're starting to experience with um, grapes that maybe have tougher root systems to deal with drought or you know global warming, climate change, things like that. 
Um, Italian wine itself is increasing, so people are experim experimenting with Sangiovese and Nebbiolo elsewhere. Um, but I think a lot of what people are still drinking from the area is Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay. Um, it's international grape varietals that people want from that area. And a lot of time, if they're going to drink an indigenous grape, um, they're going to drink it from the country that it originates, whether it be France or Italy or whatnot. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, you know, I want to kind of also touch on, so for Italian wines, the ability to purchase them here in town, where would you, if somebody wanted to start experiencing more Italian wines from a retail perspective, where would you recommend they go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess it depends on, you know, where your level of expertise is. If you haven't had any Italian wines, you really just want to get something for $10 a bottle. I think Total Wine is still your best bet for wine retail here in Las Vegas. Um, the brands aren't as necessary small production and, and, you know, unique, but you can get some really good wines for $10 or $15. If you want to step up a little bit and get a smaller production, high quality wine that's a little more maybe family owned, I think Gata Giste downtown, the new wine bar, bar from Eric Prado and Mario Enriquez is the next one spot to go. Um, you can drink the wine there. In addition, you can take the wine to go as well. They do have a retail component. And you can get a great bottle of wine for $20, $25, $30. So you're going to pay a little bit more, but you're definitely going to get a better quality wine that you can't get at Total Wine or, say, Lee's Liquor, if you will. Um, but we don't have a lot of options here in Las Vegas. I think it's something we're definitely lacking is good retail wine shops. Um, of course, you have the big guys like Total Wine and Lee's Liquor. Top Shelf is doing a decent job on some aspect, but they're still growing. Um, and I see some improvements day to day. I was at the Top Shelf on Durango, I believe it was, um, right. a couple days ago, and they had actually a decent Italian wine selection um, with some things like Paulo Scavino and um, some other good Italian producers like that. So if, if you have a Top Shelf in your area, it's great. If you want to make the trips to Gata Giste, um, that's probably your best bet for – for high quality Italian wines. Fantastic, that, that's good to know. And then um, also too, I wanted to touch a little bit about the education side. Yes. <laughs> I was, I was uh, you know, like I said, you know, when you're kind of, you hang around people, uh, you know, you get together in social settings, especially fellow food and wine lovers, you know, you're going, you go into restaurants, things of that nature, you know, there, there is, Learning by drinking and as osmosis. <laughs> However, you know, then there's a though, period that's of time. A whole nother. What's that? I said remembering it, though. That's a whole nother one. But remembering <laughs> it's another one. If somebody wanted to formalize, uh, you know, or, or sort of kind of get a more of a educational deep dive to kind of round out their learning, uh, it sounds like you, you've got your wine and spirits education trust courses at the Wine Academy. Is that also for people that are not in industry? Absolutely, Don. Um, the majority of people we see in our level one and level two classes are not industry professionals. Um, there's a lot of doctors, lawyers, housewives, people who just enjoy drinking wine. Um, they want to learn a little bit more. They want to, one, drink wine at the course, which we do have between 10 or 20 wines at each course. Um, or, like you said, they just want to be a little bit more educated and sound a little bit smarter at wine or be able to look at a wine list and know – kind of what they're ordering somewhat um, without randomly kind of pointing their finger. Um, so level one and level two courses are definitely for, you know, the amateur who maybe doesn't have any wine knowledge that just wants to learn and grow. Um, so I definitely recommend everyone go to wineacademylb.com. Um, you can see all of our classes there. Our next level one class is coming up on August 1st. Um, it's only a one day course. You taste wine and we look at some slides from 10 a.m. until about 4 p.m. You take a small multiple choice exam for the last 20 minutes or so, half an hour. Um, then you get a nice little pin and certificate that says you completed the course after as well. Um, so whether you want the pin and certificate and you're trying to move into the industry, or you really just care about the wine and the course itself, it's definitely a great place to start for people of all levels of expertise. That's fantastic. I mean, that's a that's a great way to, to kind of dedicate some time, interact, learn, get some. It's nice to know that's there. Yeah. Who, yeah, you know, when we started, uh, Colleen, you know, Las Vegas lacked that for a long time. And myself, I had to travel to Napa Valley for all of my certifications and education to start. Um, and it, it adds up. Having to pay for your flight, your hotel room, a rental car, it makes learning um, much more difficult, especially if um, money is a little bit of a worry, which it can be right now for a lot of people. 
and including myself um, and the owner of the wine academy, Gina, she also had to tra travel to Napa Valley. So uh, we both had the same kind of idea, like why not bring this to Las Vegas? And she just happened to jump on it probably six or nine months before me. Uh, and now I'm lucky enough to teach those classes for her. So uh, we're going to continue to offer classes here in Las Vegas. Um, we offer classes for Italian wine scholar, French wine scholar, uh, and we're going to continue to grow and offer classes in spirits, sake, um, and pretty much all the related beverages over time. And where is and the academy located at? Yeah, so, you know, right now we are in the new UNLV Caesars uh, building by Ikea on Durango 215. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, COVID right now, all of the UNLV buildings are closed. So we're temporarily teaching our classes through Great Expectations and uh, the Winery of Las Vegas down off of Sunset and Eastgate um, by the Valley Auto Mall. Um, that's okay. another place that you can actually go and you can make your own wine. So you can get with a couple of friends um, and then you can pick the blend of the wine. You can pick the type of barrel for how long. You can actually bottle and drink your own wine. So it's a pretty neat experience that they have going on down there. Awesome. Yeah, that is a fun place. Colleen, have you ever been over there? I have not. This is all fun to think of uh, things to do in near future. As long as COVID will allow us to do what we want to do, this is great fun because it's always been, even when you go travel the wineries in California or you're going to go even further going to Europe, go outside of our own or, or across our state, knowing, I mean, our country, anything you can know before you go helps the experience in my opinion. So having that local, because locally we didn't have to, that's why you'd go to California. That's why you'd go to Oregon or that's why you'd go. So now we don't have to, we can know something before we go. And then I think the experience is even better because you've already kind of kickstarted your trip. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Colleen. I think uh, right now is there's never been a better time in Las Vegas or Nevada in general to have um, these beverage experiences and opportunities. We have more breweries than ever we're starting to have some wineries. We have vineyards in Pahrump if you get the chance to drive an hour outside. Um, and it may not be Napa Valley, but it's an amazing experience if you've never had the opportunity to go and, and drink the wines and see the vineyard and see the grapes on the vine. Um, so I definitely recommend getting out there to Pahrump Valley Winery or something like that. Um, and to support your local you know, distilleries and breweries here in Las Vegas, as well as the rest of Nevada. The Pahrump, I'd totally forgotten about Pahrump for that too. See, this is all the stuff that's so close anymore that we can do. And repeating that Pahrump is worth going to, going to see this, to experience, et cetera. Because, I mean, I can tell you that a lot of people go, I'm not going there. <laughs> but it's, and I don't mean anything against it. It, it I want to break that Absolutely. Uh, misconception. Great day trip. Good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Michael, a couple of, couple of uh, quick fire questions here for you. And it's probably food, food and wine related. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this time of the year, you know, Prosecco, you know, Suave, you know, Rieslings for summer. But if you were, okay, you're going in and you're kind of having that a bit of an Italian style meal. And, and let's say you're, you're starting out and the, the Prosecco is already kind of, you know, you've, you've done the toast. Now you're ordering some type of um, salad or appetizer. Let's, let's say, you know, a good, good appetizer, maybe just uh, some prosciutto and melon. Would you, would you stick with a little Riesling there or what would you go with? No, I would switch it up, you know, um, especially if you're doing prosciutto, um, I, especially in the summer, I think Lambrusco is the perfect wine for that. Uh, you're getting a red wine that complements the prosciutto, uh, very well. It's definitely got high acidity, which makes it food friendly and cuts through the fat of the prosciutto. Um, and it's slightly sparkling. So a lot of times it's frizzante. It's not fully sparkling, uh, but it has a little bit of everescence. So it's still palate cleansing, um, very fresh, fruity. Um, and a lot of times you want to drink wines of the regions where the food is grown. Um, so a lot of those meats and cures are coming from Emilia Romana where Lambrusco is made. So prosciutto and Lambrusco were made to go hand in hand together um, all day long. Okay. And then if you were going, uh, let's say now, now we're, now we're doing the next course. We're into some type of, um, uh, of fish, you know, maybe, you know, um, you know, Mediterranean fish. I mean, there, you know, there's, there's some great sea basses, things of that nature, you know, like a white fish of some sort. Where, where do you, where do you lead people to next? Yeah, it really depends on if you want to stay drinking white or going to red. Um, I think if you're having seafood or something along those lines, 
Um, I really like the region of Castello de Iese, which is in La Marche. So it's a little more south and central Italy to the east of Rome. Um, and it's a region that does a grape called Bardicchio, uh, which is light bodied, easy drinking, but very food friendly for fish, shellfish, any of those lighter appetizers, uh, flares, sardines. Um, you get a little bit of salinity in the wine as well because it's really close to the ocean. So once again, um, that wine was grown where all they do is catch seafood locally and is meant to be drank with seafood and fish um, throughout the day. Awesome. Awesome. And then as we move back up the coastline, I mean, you know, you've, you've got you to gotta have a, a preemie. So, we, you know, we've got to have pasta. We'll go with a classic, you know, like a bolognese. Mm. What's, what's, uh, what's, get, where, where, where on the shelf are you going to next? Uh, yeah, that's also a tough question. You know, I think I go down to Campania for that and do a grape called Alianico. Uh, Alianico is a high acid, really a high tannin wine as well, which is really going to cut through that richness of the bolognese and the pasta. Um, and traditionally, all through Campania, this wine was drank with pizza and pasta because um, that's really all they do in that area. Um, so Alianico is an amazing grape that's underrated. Um, not a lot of people know about it, I say. Um, and one of your more notorious regions for it would be uh, Torasi, which you'll see quite often out of Campania, which does really good Alianico. And what how what would you to sort of is there a way you could relate that to another grape or style we may be more accustomed to in the states? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's similar to Cabernet Sauvignon in the fact that it is high acid, high tannins, um, so it is very food friendly with a little bit less of the body or the concentration that you're going to get with Cabernet. Um, okay. Just a little more finesse, if you will, um, but it still has that big bold structure um, that people are going to drink with Napa cabs. Fantastic. And last, because we went to the second course and we're going back, we're, we're sticking with some meats. There's something standing on the end like this. It's a big old uh, Florentine style steak. <laughs> you know, and uh, there's somebody we're going to be chatting maybe more about that here coming soon. Because Yeah, I know a little bit about that two weeks. I've eaten a lot of steaks in my day. Exactly. So we're going to finish it off with one of those beautifully uh, over the coal fired uh, steaks well how do you what would uh what would you use to kind of kind of help uh work through that yeah absolutely i mean one of those big steaks with a lot of protein you definitely want something that has a lot of tannins to uh, to really combat that and as you mentioned a fjord you know kind of originating in florence and dario, dario shakini being one of the pioneers for that steak you definitely have to go to Panzano and chianti um you either do a chianti and sangiovese blend something like Fontori and flaccinello um, or as you already have in your hand, Brunello is probably my personal favorite to, to drink with steak because Brunello has four years of aging. Um, traditionally, it's four years in oak. Now they do allow two of those years to be in the bottle, um, but that's going to give the wine a lot more of those tannins and astringency, which is going to pair with that steak really, really well. Um, so it might be something if you're going to plan to have that steak you know, later on in dinner that you order the bottle of Brunello right away. Uh, and get it opened up. I wouldn't recommend opening that bottle right before you eat the steak. It does need a half an hour to an hour of time uh, to develop the real flavor profile um, on the palate that you're going to want to go with that steak. Fantastic. That's awesome. So it, it's, uh, I, I, I love, love you choosing Brunello at the end. Like you said, open it up. Uh, one question on the Brunello. In their preparation, are they, are they pretty much using a new oak in the process or is it um, for Brunello, yes, traditionally as well. You get a lot of new oak, or you'll get mixed, you know, 60 40 new to old oak. Um, unlike Nebbiolo and Barolo, where they just do all old, large Hungarian cask, um, you do get a lot of new oak in Brunello because they want to do in, they do want to impart some of those flavors of the vanilla and the spice in addition to the tannins and the deliberate oxidation you're going to get for the Brunello as well, which is going to make that bottle hold up over time, um, as well as what makes it ageable and you can have it in your cellar for 20, 30 years if you really want to. If you have that much self-control, I never make it that far. <laughs> Same here. I get you. I get you. Well, that was, that was awesome. Appreciate the rapid fire. Colleen, any thoughts on that? I think that all the information has been absolutely priceless. And then the, the education part of it, I'd love to, to delve deeper on another, um, another segment, if at all possible, because I, I think people would get a real, at least people that I know, and I myself would get uh, a lot out of um, the 101, you know, the 101. Yeah. Just 
Yeah, Colleen, yeah. I highly recommend um, taking that next level one class if you get the opportunity. It's August 1st. Mm -hmm. It is at Grape Expectations here in Las Vegas. It's only a one-day course. Uh, you mentioned you do have some friends. Uh, so if you get a group together, I can get you a group discount. Um, if there's any restaurant tours out there, I can get you a corporate discount as well if you want to do something for your restaurant and have, you know, a certain members of your staff, your servers kind of refresh and learn. How long. So we do have some opportunities for not only people like yourself who want to just dabble a little bit, um, but also some restaurant tours who want to increase education across uh, the restaurant. So you can get groups together and then you would... Absolutely. The groups. I mean, this would be... Good. Yeah, if you get a group of five or more, I can get you a discount on that. Um, with that... Many people, you still come down to where we're teaching the class, uh, which is great because it's at Great Expectations. You can see what they do there as well for the aging of the wine. Uh, but if there are restaurant managers or owners out there that want, you know, myself to come to the restaurant itself and not actually have everyone go down to the winery, uh, we can do that as well. We can teach the certification at the restaurant, um, or I can also do some consulting and do some education here specifically toward their wine list and their restaurant in general. Perfect. Thank That's you. fantastic. And Michael, when is that le next level one starting? Yeah, the next level one is August 1st. Um, we typically do four courses per year. So it's one every three months or so. Um, so every month we have something else going on, whether it's a level one, level two, Italian wine scholar, French wine scholar. Um, so there's always something to learn about and drink. Fantastic. And that level one is just a one day course. Just a one, one day course from uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So six hours. One of those hours is a lunch break. Um, so it's not an all day commitment. It's not something you have to really stress about. Um, and it's really intended for just people with no knowledge at all that can come in and, and learn the basics of wine um, and what to drink and where to get those great That's awesome. That's, it. That's fantastic. That's awesome. I think, I think you might see a Colleen Schaefer signing up uh, online here pretty soon. Yeah, just, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm already thinking of um, people that we know that have small businesses that have a few people. I mean, this is a great um, a great idea for, for uh, group activity for, you know, we met our goals. Let's do this. Um, I mean, there's just a, any kind of a team building experience. There's a lot of a lot of applications for this. <laughs> Absolutely. It's great for team building. It brings people together. Um, it increases their knowledge, which is going to increase sales to the restaurant. So it's really a win win for everyone. Um, and especially with COVID right now, we're, in fact, we're practicing all of the, you know, proper procedures and protocols. Um, we are social distancing. We have one person per table spaced out a minimum of at least six feet. Um, I teach the class with a mask on the entire time. We have sanitizer available for everyone. I wash my hands every half an hour or so. Um, and then I use gloves when I'm pouring the wine as well. So we don't allow people to touch the bottles and pour wine for themselves anymore. Um, one of the precautions we've taken is I'll wear gloves and wash my hands and pour the wine. So that bottle doesn't go around the room from person to person and, and we minimize contact and exposure possibilities for COVID-19. Excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Michael, you know, this, uh, we, we ran a little long there, but you know, we could talk about wine all day long and then we'd be moving right from coffee over to some type of uh, Italian varietal. I might have to do that now. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Fantastic. Well, this has been awesome. I, we appreciate you coming on. This is a, it was a great discussion about wine in general and such. And, uh, you know, probably a little later in the year, kind of have you back as we, as, as temperatures start to cool off and uh, people start to look for, okay, well, let's move into more of the reds, have a little chat about that. In Absolutely. the meantime, too, for those that are tuning in, if you have a question for uh, Michael, leave it in the comments. We'll definitely get those over to him. And also be sure to check out WineAcademyLV.com so you can learn more about the um, Wine and Spirits Education Trust. And definitely, Michael, you know, we're going to definitely be in touch because I know you, you between the education, sales and such and consulting, I know you've got a couple other irons in the fire. I do that uh, hopefully you know we'll we'll be excited to chat about more and and uh, share out to the peeps i'm excited for it can't come soon enough yep absolutely so we thank everyone for tuning in uh michael this has been uh been awesome today and uh thank you very much colleen you get you got your you got your notes there oh you should see them yes <laughs> <laughs> underscored and, and you know bold 
Awesome. Thank you, Michael, so much. This was great. Thank you, Colleen. Great to meet you. Thanks, Don. So, nice to on meet behalf you. of Colleen Schaefer, I'm Don Kramer with the Kramer Group at Urban Nest Realty. We appreciate Michael being on today. Again, if you have any questions for him, put them in the comments below. We'll get them over to him. Um, we've also got a couple other episodes coming up this week. As you know, Wednesday is always our uh, weekly recap on the housing market. You know, we're signs are still uh, looking very interesting, and we look forward to sharing those stats tomorrow. And we've got a couple little catch-up items, a little news and tips and tricks on Thursday. And then Friday, we have a special guest on as well, Dustin Waters with the Waters Aquatech, discussing, uh, and we'll have a little chat over coffee about outdoor spaces, pools, spas, and kind of creating that ultimate outdoor living space. So another great interview later in the week. But we today, you know, we could talk to uh, Michael all day. I know we'll hopefully be catching up soon either at one of his classes or over a, a over an Aperol spritz or a great glass of wine at one of the fabulous restaurants here in town. So Michael, pleasure as always. Thanks again for tuning in, for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thanks everybody. And out there, we wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks for tuning in till next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.